My text for tonight is found in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 33. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 9, and beginning in verse 33. The title of this message is, The Last Shall Be First. Mark chapter 9, and I want to begin reading in verse 33, and as I do, I have selected this text because it does speak of servanthood, which a deacon is called to fulfill, but it speaks to every one of us here tonight. For there's not a one of us who is not saved but to serve. Uh, One of the great reasons for which we have been redeemed and bought with a great price is that we would be enlisted and employed in the Lord's service, to be actively involved and engaged in the business of the kingdom of God. And so tonight, as we will look at this passage, I trust that the Lord will use this uh, to challenge you and to motivate you, to encourage you as you consider your life and how your life is being invested in the lives of others, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is not a believer among us here tonight who is not called by God's grace to be a servant in the body of Christ and to give ourselves for the good of others. I want to begin reading in verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What are you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all, taking a child He set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So many things that Jesus said about greatness in the kingdom of God are counterintuitive. Uh, That is to say, they are different from our natural way of thinking. The kingdom of God, it can be said, is an upside-down kingdom when compared to the way this world thinks. In the kingdom of God, Jesus said, those who are poor in spirit are rich. Those who mourn are comforted. Those who are hungry are are satisfied. Jesus was always saying things and putting them in a provocative way, which would be the very opposite of what a natural mind would think. Jesus said, those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And Jesus said, those who are empty will be filled. Those who give will receive. Jesus said, those who lose their life will keep it, but those who keep their life will lose it. Jesus said, we must die if we are to live, but if we merely live, we shall die. This, in this passage, is yet another instance in which our Lord speaks paradoxically or so seemingly contradictory regarding greatness in the kingdom of God. Here Jesus says, those who are last will be first. And those who are first, it is implied, will be last. Jesus says, those who are greatest are those who are servants, not those who have many servants, or not those who are served by many people. Greatness belongs to the one who is the servant of all. This passage tells us much about true greatness in the kingdom of God. Jesus teaches who is first in the kingdom is the greatest. 
Now, this may not be so by human estimation, nor by human appraisal, nor by human eyes, but it is by God's estimate and by God's appraisal. And after all, that is all that really matters. Now, this text demonstrates how different the church is from the world and what is the true mark of greatness. Well, I want us to look at this passage tonight, and again, it applies to each and every one of us. I need to hear this. I need to be reminded of God's purpose for for my life. And I believe so do you as well. And so I pray that God will use this in each one of our lives. It will cause us to some extent to evaluate and examine ourselves, to see am I a mere spectator in the Christian life, or is my shoulder really to the plow, and am I stretching and straining myself to give myself in the service of others? As we look at this text, I want to begin, uh, or I want to give you four headings. The first is the diagnostic question. This incident begins with our Lord asking a probing question, and that is in verse 33. They came to Capernaum. The they refers to Jesus and the twelve, and as you know, Capernaum functioned really as Jesus' ministry headquarters. It is on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee, and Capernaum was the place where he first called Peter and Andrew and James and John to himself. It is where Jesus said uh, that it was, he was at home and it was his own city. He actually called Capernaum his own city. It is where he chose and called Matthew, the tax collector, It is where he performed so many of his miracles. It was where he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And it was where the paralytic was lowered through the roof. And he said, take up your pallet and walk. It is where he cast out an unclean demon. So they came to Capernaum, and in a very real sense, they came home. Certainly, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, it was home for them as well as Matthew, And now it was Jesus' adopted home. And it says, when he was in the house. Please note, it does not say a house, but the house. The definite article, the. And the house probably refers to Peter's house. Now, there were many times in which Jesus gathered in Peter's house in order to minister. One of which is in the first chapter of this book, when he healed Peter's mother-in-law. So we know that Peter was married, and Peter probably had children. It may well be that the child that he took into his arms in verse 36 may have been Peter's own young son. And so we read, when he was in the house, he began to question them. The reason Jesus began to question them was not in order that he would gain information that he did not previously have. It was a question in order to test them, to examine them. Now, the twelve, as they are in the house with Jesus, Jesus used this as an opportunity to probe into their lives. And he asked them this question, what were you discussing on the way? Now, Jesus knows what they were discussing on the way, as he knows all things, but he asks the question in order to force them to think, to recall, and to look back at what had been the discussion that they had been having. Now, Jesus knew exactly what they had been discussing, and it was what they discussed so often. Though it is not directly stated in this verse, the rest of the context makes it very clear that what they have been discussing is who among them, among the twelve, is the greatest. They are very immature in their faith. They are very childish in their walk with the Lord, and they had this ongoing debate among them, who was the greatest? 
If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 20, you will see the continuation of this discussion because it's something that Jesus must now directly address in their lives. In Matthew chapter 20, I want to begin reading in verse 17 just to set the context. Verses 19 and following, or verses 20 and following is what I really want us to see. But in verse 17, this is following this account. Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. That's a pretty significant bit of information that the Lord has just given to them. And it really calls for some kind of a response. Unfortunately, what we see in the next verse will begin the wrong response. Our Lord has just said that He will be crucified, in essence, in Jerusalem, and He will be raised from the dead. But notice verse 20, then. That is to show the immediate connection of what now follows from what He just said. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. Those were the two premier positions in the kingdom to sit at the right hand of Christ and to sit at the left hand of Christ, to have closest proximity to our Lord and to be closest to His authority and to be perceived by others as being first. Now, James and John, in reality, have put their mother up to do their bidding to some way screen uh, and veil their selfish ambition, and it reveals a little bit of their motives as they are following the Lord. Now, this is not unique to James and John, by the way. You'll note in verse 24 that when the other ten heard that James and John's mother posed the question, in verse 24, we read, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. The reason is because they wanted to be on the left and on the right. Their mother beat them to ask the question. So they are all uh, acting extraordinarily immature, childish, as they are pursuing this question. Who among them is greatest? Even as we trace this out to the very end of our Lord's public ministry, as they entered the upper room, they were having this ongoing debate. It was more than a discussion. It it was an in-house debate, an intramural debate among the disciples. Even as they go into the upper room the night before, our Lord will be crucified. So, Jesus now asks this diagnostic question, What were you discussing on the way in order to bring to the forefront this issue which he must address in their lives? For no one can be greatly used by God who who is self-focused and self-preoccupied. No one can be mightily used by God who are seeking to elevate themselves and to exalt themselves in the service of the Lord. So this leads second to the deafening silence. Verse 34 gives the disciples response, and it became embarrassingly quiet. In verse 34 we read, but they kept silent. Not a one of them dared to open their mouth. Not even this time did Peter open his mouth. 
Normally, Peter would come running in to answer the question for everyone. And normally, Peter needs an afterfoot mint to, to cover up what he has just said. But even Peter now is strangely silent, and the reason is because Jesus has put his finger on the live nerve within their, within their fellowship. They are so ashamed and so convicted that they had enough sense at this point to at least be silent. It's like the old expression, stop while you're behind. So they just stop talking, and they are silent. Now, here is why they remained silent. Note the next word, for, F-O-R. This introduces the explanation that Mark gives to us why they kept silent. We do not have to speculate. We do not have to wonder. The text directly tells us why they became, why they became muted. For on the way they had discussed, and again, this discussion was really a debate to the point of an argument. They had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. What they will not say, Mark now provides the explanation for us. Uh, they were involved in a very selfish argument, and their sudden silence reveals they knew that they were entirely wrong in being engaged in this, in this discussion. Uh, they were proud, they were self-seeking, they were self-promoting, they were self-sufficient, they were self-centered, and the timing of this selfish in-house discussion is shocking, quite frankly. And so this is the deafening silence. And there are times, I believe, in each of our lives when we can so relate to these disciples and identify as the Word of God probes our own hearts and our own lives and reveals to ourselves those aspects of our Christian character that needs significant attention. If these twelve disciples, especially the eleven who know the Lord, if these eleven are in great need of their character being altered and transformed by the grace of God, then it is safe to say that you and I here tonight remain in constant need of the Holy Spirit to carry out His work of sanctification in our own hearts and in our own lives and to make us yet more and more of what we must be becoming in our pursuit of Christ likeness. Well, this leads now to number three, to the doctrinal teaching in verse 35. This is a golden teaching moment for our Lord in the lives of His own disciples. Uh, this is an informal, impromptu setting. It is not a classroom setting. It, this is something that occurs in the very flow of life and this becomes a strategic opportunity for our Lord to instruct His disciples into what they must become if they are to be instruments in the hand of God to be used in His kingdom. So verse 35, sitting down. To sit down is really the posture of a Jewish rabbi to enter into important instruction. We read it, in, for example, in Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount, He sat, the people stood. We have somewhat the opposite today, where the preacher stands and the people sit. But to sit was to assume the, the chair or the seat of the instructor. And so our Lord, now sitting down, He assumes the posture of the master teacher that He is, and he called the twelve and said to them. 
He, he has called them perhaps from other parts of the house, probably Peter's house, to gather together now around him that he can give this instruction. And this is what he says. If anyone wants to be first, when he says first, he's referring to first in recognition in the kingdom, first in reward in the kingdom. If anyone wants to be first, and this is not a, an improper thing to, be, to want to be first, because there is no glory in making one's desire to be the worst Christian one could possibly be. Uh, we all ought to want to be first in the sense of being most Christ-like. I would remind us all that Jonathan Edwards, writing in his 70 resolutions, one of his resolutions, number 56, or number 53, was that he would be the most complete Christian on the face of the earth in his generation. As a young teenager, age 18, he set a course for his life that there would be, knowing that there would be but one Christian who would stand out the most in his generation, who would be most used by God, who would be most godly, and who would be most Christ-like, Jonathan Edwards said, resolved, I will be that man in my times. And every one of us here tonight ought to desire to resolve to be that man, that woman in this generation. So he says, if anyone wants to be first, that is not a rebuke. In reality, that is an encouragement. And my desire for you as your pastor is that you would excel in your Christian life and that you would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And that on the last day when our Lord dispenses His rewards, then you would be first in that day. And as Paul said of the Thessalonians, for them to receive the crown is the only crown He so desires. And so I desire that for your life, that you would be first on the last day, that you would so excel in the grace of God that you would be recognized by our Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, here comes the condition. And what a challenging condition it is. If anyone will be first, he shall be last of all and the servant of all. To be last does not mean to be the worst. Uh, to be last uh, does not mean to be the least in grace or to be the least in Christ-likeness. Uh, Jesus supplies His own definition of what it is to be last of all with the last four words and servant of all. Uh, to be last of all is to assume a lowly posture and to have a lowly attitude and to humble oneself to the point that one desires to come alongside of others and to serve the needs of others. This is a radical reversal of worldly values. This is a complete reversal of how the disciples saw it. This is a highly paradoxical statement. At this point, the disciples assumed that to be first, they would have the other disciples under them as their assistants, and that the other disciples, they could delegate things to them, that they would be in charge on behalf of the Lord, and they would be surrounded by the other ten who would carry out their bidding, and they would receive all the credit. That was in their mind of what it is to be first. For them to be first is to be first of all and to be served by all. But Jesus totally turns this on its head 
and speaks in an antithetical way, in a contradictory way, and he says, no, to be first is not to be first of all, it is to be last of all. Uh, to come under in order to serve those who are around you. A servant is one who attends to the needs of others. A servant is one, really, who has lost any sense of self-importance and seeks to serve his master and to do the will of his master. A servant is one who gives himself away to others. It is one who invests himself or herself in the interests of others. A servant is one who tirelessly sacrifices on behalf of another. A servant is one who assumes a humble attitude and humble posture and voluntarily gives himself or herself to help others who are in need. A servant is one who has lost all sense of personal need and is focused and riveted upon the needs of others. To be the servant of all means that there is no one too beneath them to serve. This is the premium that Jesus is placing upon being the servant of all. The word servant, diakonos, is the very word that is translated for deacon in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. And the predominant idea of a servant is the labor done for the master and those who are in the house of the master. A servant is a doer, not a mere observer. A servant is a laborer, not a mere spectator. A servant is a worker, not a mere talker. The word servant is used multiple times in the New Testament. It is used in John 2 of the servants or the attendants at the wedding feast in Cana who went and filled the water pots with water and brought them to Jesus. And they are those behind the scenes doing the work that is necessary. In Matthew 22, the servant are, servants are those at the wedding feast who es escorted out those who came into the king's banquet without the king's wedding clothes. In Romans 13, the servant is the government official who is in reality doing the will of God in serving the citizens of the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 3, the servant is the one who sows the good seed of the Word, and another servant comes along and waters it. In 1 Timothy 3, the servant is the deacon who serves faithfully the needs of the body of Christ. What Jesus is saying to His disciples is so, is so diametrically opposite and so polarizing from what they had been assuming as Jesus now says to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Having said this, let me be very clear that this is not saying that it is uns unspiritual to be successful in business, in athletics, in education, in scholarship, or whatever it is that the Lord would call you to do. And this is not saying that it is unspiritual to improve one's position in life. It is not saying that it is unspiritual for one to own his or her own company and other people to work for you. It is not saying that it is unspiritual to be over others in a business organizational chart. It is not saying that it is unspiritual to be the first string on your sports team and others are behind you. 
It is not saying that it is unspiritual to win in a contest or in competition. But what this is saying is that we must assume the posture of meekness and clothe ourselves with humility and lower ourselves within our own hearts and be willing to serve the needs of others as they are around us. And Jesus is teaching that greatness in the kingdom of God is not determined by status, but by servanthood. And so this is the doctrinal teaching. And it is very important that we hear the words of our Lord again. For it to be well for us as believers when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on the last day, there will be the review of our lives. We will not give an account for our sin that has been paid at the cross. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. But on the last day when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we will stand as a servant before our Master. And we will give an account to Him for how we gave ourselves in serving others. Each one of us has been allotted so much time and so much talent and so much treasure. And did we hoard it for ourselves? Or did we give ourselves away in serving the needs of others? On that last day at the judgment seat of Christ, every one of us will give an account to the Lord. And for those of us who have been faithful by God's grace, there will be great reward. And But for those who have squandered many opportunities in their spiritual lives, to step forward and to step into places of service and to extend the kingdom of God, there will be less reward on that last day. And so what a motivating factor it should be in our own hearts and souls that we would please Him in every respect of our Christian lives, knowing that the final day of accountability will yet come as we stand before the Lord. Look around you. What needs do you see present in the lives of others? What opportunities are there? What open doors are there? Who needs your encouragement? Who needs your coming alongside and putting your shoulder to their plow and to help them in what God has called them to do. Every one of us must be mindful of this fact that we are saved to serve, and serve we must in the name of the Lord. Finally, I want you to note in verses 36 and 37, the designated example. To follow up the teaching of verse 35, Jesus is such a master teacher with His disciples that He gives a perfect illustration of what He is saying. Not only has He told them what a servant, or not only has He told them who is first, but now He shows them. So in verse 36, we read, in taking a child... Uh, Jesus took a child now to be an object lesson of the truth He just spoke. Uh, this child was in the house nearby. If this was Peter's house, as I mentioned earlier, which it probably was Peter's house, by the way, this is probably one of His children. We cannot be certain about that. And this word for child uh, can include either an infant or a toddler or a very young child. But Jesus gathers into His arms a child, and He set him. It's a son. It's not a daughter. It's a son. He set him before them, before these strong, burly fishermen, before these manly men who have been arguing 
and debating among themselves which one of them is closest to the Lord and ha is the greatest. And taking him in his arms, Jesus literally embraces this child in his arms and holds the child before the disciples. And he said to them, and as he now says this, he is giving an, an oral object, uh, he is giving an object lesson to them. And he says in verse 37, whoever receives one child like this, and when he says whoever, he is referring to one of them most specifically. The whoever extends to every Christian in every generation, on every continent, down through the age until the return of Christ. But specifically, this is addressed to the disciples as he looks into their eyes and speaks to them, whoever receives one child like this. When he says receives one child like this, he means whoever welcomes such a one whoever shows hospitality, whoever comes alongside and, and gives help and encouragement, whoever stops what they are doing and gives a gracious reception to such a child, Jesus says, in my name, meaning that the motive is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The motive is the glory of God. The motive is the extension of the kingdom of God. Whoever in my name receives one child like this, he says, receives me. This is the net effect. It is the same as receiving the Lord Jesus Christ himself whenever we serve the needs of even a child like this. This attitude or this idea is present in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 35, when Jesus will indicate to do any act of service towards another is in reality the same as doing it unto the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. In Matthew 25, in verse 35, Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we feed you? When were you thirsty? Or when did we give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger? When did we invite you in? When, did we, when were you naked and when did we clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Close quote. Jesus is so indivisibly identified with and united to every believer in the kingdom of God. That when we serve another brother or sister in Christ, from the divine perspective, it is as though we are serving Jesus Christ Himself. How motivated would we be tonight? if Jesus Christ were to walk into this worship center. First of all, we would all fall on our face and hide ourselves from the resplendent glory of His presence. But if He was to appear in His mode of humiliation, in His incarnation mode, 
and walk among us as he did 2,000 years ago. If he were to ask us, would you give me a ride home? Would you, would you help me get in the car with all my things that I brought tonight? We would be crawling over one another to get to the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to help him in everything that he needed. If he was to say to us, do you have money for me to have dinner tonight? Uh, could you help me drive me home? Every one of us would be so motivated, I myself. And yet so often we see a brother or a sister in Christ in need, and we pass them by because we are concerned about where we need to be or what we need to do. What Jesus is saying here is that we are the body of Christ. And while His body is no longer here upon the earth, His physical body, He has ascended back to heaven, and He is now robed in, in regal robes of sovereignty as He is seated at the right hand of, of God the Father. But we as believers here upon the earth, we are now the body of Christ. And we are the hands of Christ, and we are the feet of Christ, and we are the shoulder of Christ, and the mouth of Christ, and we are to be an extension of Christ and to serve others in His absence while He is enthroned. We are very alive and active here, and we are to be continually engaged in pouring out our lives into the needs of others. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Look at it again in verse 37. Whoever receives one child like this in my name, and remember, he's holding this child up before the disciples. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me. The idea is not, does not receive me only, but him who sent me. What a remarkable solidarity there is between the Father and the Son. And what a solidarity there is between other believers and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, to receive me is to receive the one who sent me, a reference to the Father. Those two are indivisibly one in purpose and one in, in, their, in their ministry. And so we are one with Christ as we serve others. What a remarkable statement this is. I think we see how incumbent it is upon us if we would desire to be first in the kingdom, then we must humble ourselves and be actively engaged and be actively involved in pouring our lives into others. That begins with where the Lord has placed you. It begins in your home. It begins with your family. It begins serving your spouse, your children. It extends into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we function as a church body, all of the needs that are present can never be met unless each person assumes his or her responsibility to exercise their spiritual gift and to serve the needs of others. But it goes beyond our church and how we may serve other believers in, in other places. And sometimes it involves other places in the world. This is a part of being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to conclude by asking you, What should we assume, or what should we expect if we are to be the servant of others? I want to conclude by giving you five things that as you serve the Lord, the net effect 
in your life. Each one of these should serve as a motivating factor in your life to pour your life into the needs of others. Number one, it glorifies God. When we serve the Lord, it glorifies God. And when we fail to serve God, it robs God of His glory. When we serve God, we are pursuing the will of God for our lives. It is God's will for every believer to serve in His kingdom. And when we serve the Lord, we are fulfilling the work that He has foreordained for us to do. This brings glory to God because we are accomplishing His work. We are fulfilling His path and His plan that He has for our lives. This brings glory to God. But when we, when we are inactive and when we are passive and when we are simply taking but not giving, that dishonors the Lord. So let us give glory to God. Let us give honor to His name by serving in His kingdom. Second, it brings help to others. When we serve, and we act, as I've already said, as the hands and the feet of Christ in reaching out to others. We are an extension of our glorified, ascended, enthroned Lord in heaven. He is there. We are here, and we are acting in His place. And we become the active body of Christ on the earth in helping others as though it were Christ Himself in our midst. And what help and what strength we are able to give to others as we serve their needs. Third, it brings reality to our confession. Serving others in the name of Christ brings validity to our profession of Jesus as Lord. James 2.14 says, faith without works is dead. And we cannot say that we are truly followers of Christ if we are not serving Christ and serving others. And James would call into question the validity of our faith if we are not serving the needs of others. As I have already said, we are saved to serve, and when we serve, it demonstrates the reality of our true saving faith in Christ. Fourth, it brings strength to our faith. Serving Christ exercises our spiritual muscles. We grow stronger in the Lord as we serve others. We all need to be involved in, in some heavy lifting in serving the kingdom of God. Otherwise, we lapse into being a spiritual weakling. And we lapse into being a, a, a spiritual couch potato, if you will. We become flabby and, and fat in our faith and no longer lean and strong and, and trim in our devotion to the Lord. Exercising our spiritual muscles is absolutely necessary to have a vibrant heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve Him because of our love for Him, but it also strengthens our heart for Him as well. And finally, it brings joy to our hearts. The more we serve, the more there is a sense of pleasure that we have in our own soul, that God is using me, and we feel like a round peg in a round hole, and we are fulfilling the very purpose for which God has placed us here upon the earth, and what joy and, and pleasure it brings to our heart. I remember that scene in Chariots of Fire when, when Eric Little says, when I run, I feel His pleasure. But well, when we serve, we feel His pleasure. There is a sense of enlarged um, enjoyment of the Lord and a sense of greater happiness 
that floods our heart and soul as we give our lives away to others. So how critically important it is that each and every one of us not simply be takers, but that we be givers. Not that we be merely served, but that we serve others. If we had 10,000 lives, we ought to give every single one of them to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is so worthy. He is worthy of our very best. He is worthy of our complete devotion and our total commitment to be engaged in His work, to put our shoulder to His plow, to serve in His vineyard, and to be a part of what He is doing here in the world. Who is the greatest among us? Only the Lord knows. It will take another world to reveal who is the greatest among us. As we look around, we are so prone to exaggerate our estimation of who is the greatest among us. I'm sure that when we stand on that last day before the Lord, and the Lord calls out our name, and we come and appear before Him, and He bestows His reward, I'm sure that there will be so many that we will have worshipped next to and perhaps even served next to who have gone unnoticed by so many in the body or in the greater kingdom of God. But the Lord knows, and the Lord has taken note, and the Lord will not forget, and the Lord will reward on that last day. He says, Behold, I come quickly, <clears throat> and my reward is with me, to give to every man according to his works. Let there be many good works in the name of Christ in your life. And the one who is to be first is the one who will be the servant.